into this microphone. The button is pushed. Thank you for your concern. Does this not lock? It's not designed for incredibly short people, I don't think. <laughs> right. How's that? Can you hear? Right. So you can move it real close to your mouth. I'm going to hold it up like this. Uh, I'm not doing that. You can detach it if you each want one. I have another mic if you want to hold it. Do you want one to hold? This picks up yelling, right? OK, so are we? <clears throat> I guess we will do the, uh, yeah. <laughs> the song and dance show here. <clears throat> All right, so this session, uh, actually uh, two sessions back to back that we're going to talk about some of the new security features with uh, PowerShell 5. So it will require Windows 10, but we'll get into all of that. So this is Lee Holmes from the product team. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Not going to get much better than this, so come on. And, uh, Until you talk about the next speaker. <laughs> Jeff Hicks. Yeah. So what we wanted to talk about today was um, defending the defenders. There's been a lot of news in, in the news lately about PowerShell security. You hear it most often, for example, in anti-malware blogs, people talking about the newest PowerShell attacks. So what we wanted to talk about too, uh, a little bit here is to set the stage. When you hear about PowerShell security, what you're not hearing about is actual vulnerabilities in PowerShell. What people are talking about is you've got an attacker who's already compromised the machine. So for example, you've got a web application that's got a vulnerability. They break into that web application, web application and they decide to start using PowerShell once they've compromised that machine. So that's really important to think about as a baseline here. Scripting languages and assembly language and C++ and compiled languages, they've been used from the dawn of time as a way for attackers to take one machine and extend that reach to another machine. Now, how many people here like PowerShell? So how many people would put their hands down if they were told to break into, into a network? Nobody, right? You're gonna, I love PowerShell regardless of what I'm doing. So attackers, have the same desire to have a great work environment and have fun typing commands. So that's why you're seeing PowerShell more often in the news, is that they're discovering this awesome shell that we all have. They discover that it's got great management capabilities, and they just decide that their management is going to be stuff on top of the infrastructure that you laid down. And they can do a lot with very little effort. Which right. is what we all know about PowerShell, and they're discovering, oh, this is a great tool. Exactly. So that's the baseline to think about here as we start to talk about the advances that we've made in PowerShell version 5 and Windows 10. Now if you've heard about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You start with the uh, baseline of things that you gotta have water, you gotta have food. Then as you start to go up the chain, everything builds on, on the next level. So it's not really wor worth worrying about how many Facebook followers you have if you know you don't know where you're sleeping for the night. So when people talk about PowerShell as security, you start to hear about people concerned about PowerShell security, and you naturally start to hear about, well, what can I start to do to defend these PowerShell attacks? So this is a very important way to think about holistic security, is it doesn't really matter if you're blocking PowerShell attacks, if the user can download Mimikatz, you know, a very, very common attack tool, it doesn't matter if you're blocking these PowerShell attacks. If an attacker can bring Mimikatz off of GitHub or just a binary that they found online and run it on your network, that's the kind of thing that antivirus can help. Broad scale breach on a domain. Maybe antivirus isn't good enough because you found, for example, personally, that you've got a virus that worked its way into your network Maybe it was a, a phishing attack against one of your administrators. You want to block that exact thing? That's where you can start to bring in app blocker policies in a deny mode. Deny mode is not the be all and end all. 
a loud mode is where it starts to really become a security, uh, security benefit. Because that way, an attacker gets into your network, they can't just download something from GitHub, compile it, and run it. C++, C Sharp assembly, doesn't really matter what the language is. If you're not blocking it, you don't need to block these, these PowerShell attacks. Now, if you're not auditing the protections, so somebody turns off AppLocker, they turns off, they start clearing the event logs, if you're not auditing these things, you're also blind. So there's another prevention you want to do. <laughs> then there's where you start to get into the interesting world of, well, what if people, if I'm auditing the protections, I've got app blocker in a whitelist mode so that people can't just run random exes on my network. Now you might have attackers who are starting to say, well, what can I do on this machine that allows me to bypass app blocker that lets me be forensically clean so even if somebody has captured a hard disk image, they can't see what I did. That's where you start to get into some of this really, really high-end stuff. And truth be told, most people aren't even at app locker in deny or allow mode. So really, really think about that as the context here. Now once you've got capturing of the host-based artifacts, that's when you start talking about memory-based artifacts. So somebody is forensically clean in terms of you're not going to notice that a thing that hit disk you're auditing these things, so if it hit the disk, you won't even, if it didn't hit the disk, you won't see it. Then there's memory auditing. So this is a very, very strong way to think about, am I concentrating on the right thing? And what you'll hear people say is, oh, you know, they'll ask us, you know, hey, I'd like to really think about how we can start blocking these PowerShell attacks or blocking these Mimikatz thing. That's where you start to have the discussion with them, like, well, what are we doing about uh, if somebody brings in a random XE? What if they use the C Sharp compiler on the box to compile their attack? Are we protecting that? That's the, really the first thing to ask them as us, as security representatives um, in, in the ecosystem. Now that said, we are talking in this presentation of that top level of what are we doing in PowerShell version 5 and Windows 10 to start making a, a big impact on making the job a little bit less interesting for attackers when they're using PowerShell. And you're also taking a specific mindset in this approach, right? We're, we're assuming that there's a problem or that you have been breached. That's exactly it. The, as hard as you try, the thought process is always assume that somebody's gotten in. It doesn't mean that that's a good thing. You know, if, if somebody finds a vulnerability, for example, in that web application, you tell the web application develop, developer to fix that bug. But if you assume that something like that will always exist, you don't want to just roll over and say, I'm sorry, here's my network, um, just try to be nice with my domain admin. <laughs> you know, you, you want to be really assuming breach and seeing what you can do to, to prevent further breach. Because in, in reality, a breach is only bad once they've taken the assets that you really care about. If they've broken into a, a web application and all they're doing is seeing a static node that you're blasting every hour with DSC, that really doesn't matter too much. It's not good, but it's not the end of the world. And an assumed breach could also mean a disgruntled or unhappy admin, someone who has access to the key, keys to the kingdom, same type of thing. I mean, it's not necessarily a malicious intruder from the outside. You've got someone who inside who you know, the stolen scenario, right? Yep. Take that thing. Now, uh, as a little bit of a, an aside here, this is one of our great regrets in PowerShell. Now, you talk about web applications. Every language has this concept called injection vulnerabilities. So web applications have it through cross-site scripting, where you take user input, dump it right back into the HTML, Anything written as a CGI application, let's say Perl or Bash or anything, people run system commands like this, invoke expression. So this is a situation where you might see somebody exposing a custom function in a constrained PowerShell run space. So this person is really intending to only let you run get process when PowerShell is in the name. So if you see this function, 
in uh, invoke expression in anything associated with potentially attacker input, you've got a bug. You've got a big bad bug. Because dollar sign name here could include semicolon, format C drive. Invoke expression takes anything that's given to it and runs it as though it's a full on PowerShell script. So you're running a pipeline here and not just giving a parameter to name. So as we're reviewing scripts um, that we see people are, let's say, deploying in a PowerShell constrained run space, really keep your eyes on this because there's a bunch of different ways to fix it. So if you see invoke expression, use one of the many ways that PowerShell has that are secure ways to provide untrusted input to a command. Now I'm just mentioning this to be aware of it. If you run into this situation, we have added in PowerShell version 5 a API that lets you safely escape some of this attacker input if you are forced by a terrorist to put it into invoke expression. That terrorist might be an application that only takes a string, but whatever it is, there are techniques you have. If you see somebody saying, I want to make this safe for an attacker input, and they're replacing single quotes with two single quotes, uh, that is a bug. These are the APIs that you want to do to fix it. All right, so one of the issues, again, we're going to assume, you're going to assume something bad is going to happen in my network, or someone, some bad actor or some bad piece of software. One of the ways that you can do this, and actually how many of you right now as a part of your daily process IT for whatever reasons have to audit and use transcripts or everything that you do in PowerShell? Wow, I would have expected at least a couple people. Now, why is that? Why don't you use transcripts more? Anyone? They don't work in the IIC. They don't work in the IIC, one. What else? Too much, data. Too, much too much data. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, anyone else? Why don't you use transcripts in your production work? Yeah. Most of the stuff that I run is automated process, and it just has logging code. Okay, so, so I don't I don't log, I don't transcript what I'm doing interactively. I don't do much interactive. All right, so you're keeping all of that. So the, the, he's saying that he, when he writes his scripts, he includes his own built-in auditing and logging, so transcripts really are. So no one here worries about when an admin logs on to a server that you keep some paper trail of what that person has done. No one does that. It's also the info security guys haven't gotten a wind of it yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we do have in the next version of Windows, some enhancements, some improvements to transcripts, which hopefully will maybe eliminate some of these issues that you have. We now have the ability for, for one, to do transcripts in the IC, <coughs> or really I think any hosting application for PowerShell. <coughs> so that should eliminate that. Now personally, I don't think you should be running production scripts and stuff in the IC anyway, but that's a separate uh, issue. We can now set up transcripts that will capture everything regardless of whether, whatever console it might be running it. So you, now you don't have to worry about writing a, a script and include your own logging functions. You can just get that logging happening automatically. And we also have the ability to integrate with the new MC stuff. We're going to talk about that. Yeah, the question here. Does transcript uh, capture the security context to running the script? And does it capture whether it's being delegated or uh, impersonated? So the, the question is, does the uh, transcript capture basically some meta information about who's running it, where they're running it from? Yeah, I think you're going to see some improvements that when I get to the demos. And there was another question. I was just saying, you know, Jeff said, it's the next version of PowerShell. So weeks, it means that I can go all the way down to my Windows 7 box, right? Um, With system-wide treasury, the question? Yeah, the question is about, you know, the, the new transcript features I'm talking about. I said they're the new, the next, they're PowerShell 5. 
And his question is, oh, does that mean then when the new bill comes up that I can get that? And that I don't know. So sure. the, the uh, answer there, a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today is actually brought down into the 2K8R2 update. So the, the version 4 update, a lot of the security stuff is already available if you apply that patch. So transcripting, broad transcripting is included in that. In addition, PowerShell version 5, which we're, we're in preview right now, that will include these, these features, of course. The one thing I wanted to bring up as a little bit of a background is what is kind of the focus on what we've been doing with, with PowerShell and security in V5? So there's really two things to think about. Uh, one of them is, you know, people aren't breaking your systems uniquely with PowerShell. So what we're really trying to do is make PowerShell security transparent. What we found as an issue is that people are using PowerShell, let's say during an attack or during a virus, and you don't know why, you don't know how. It's complicated to go back and try to figure out what's happened. So PowerShell is just, our goal is to say, hey, here's everything that's happened, here's everything that's done, make it really easy for you to analyze, reverse. Um, if you've ever tried to reverse engineer a C++ application, malware that's been dropped on your domain, it's insane. PowerShell makes it a lot, lot better. So turning what used to be sort of a, a, a challenge into a strength now of reverse engineering PowerShell. So there's PowerShell becoming security transparent, which is a really, really important thing. And then what we'll get to after that is what, what PowerShell and Windows 10 features are there to actually protect the system even more than it was previously protected, not just regarding PowerShell. So I'm going to do some quick demos here with the transcription. Now, as I said, Lee and I kind of combined our talks here. So my demos I built on my test network, and I use myself with remoting. I'm doing them for the first time on Lee's machine, but hopefully we can get them to work here. So bear with me. Yeah. yeah. Before you get too far past the transcription, is that on by the fault of version 5? Are there any printers you can set, like how much disk space is it going to use, uh, rollover time, et cetera? I have to set that. So the, um, the PowerShell transcripts, so one thing we didn't really mention here is what's the difference between a PowerShell transcript and the PowerShell event log? So the way to think about a PowerShell transcript is that is kind of an over the shoulder view of what somebody's doing. It shows the input, shows the output, and that's a great summary of just generally what's happened in the session. There's a second logging facility that we'll get into in a bit, which is actually the script block logging. That goes into the Windows event log and has rollover policies and whatever. So I will show you in a second how it's possible to set up transcripting to go to a centralized location, automate it, turn it on by default, and that's straight file based, so it doesn't have any sort of rollover policies or logging policies. That would be a thing that you would implement in your collection infrastructure. The event log based transcripting is based on Windows eventing and it has that by default. All right, so I just quickly showed you what I'm running here on Lee's little pad here. So we are Windows 8.1, and you can see the version of PowerShell. So I'm just going to create real quickly here, a folder where I'm going to keep locally, for right now, this is for my demo purposes, all of the transcripts that I might want to create. So I'm going to create my logs folder. The start transcript commandlet in the next version here, let's do help. It's always strange driving someone else's laptop. It just, you know, I feel like I'm cheating on my <laughs> laptop. <laughs> oh, now, in, now, correct me if I'm wrong here, but in Windows 10, the start transcript commandlet has different parameters than what you get on Windows 8.1. Yes, so we've added parameters to start transcript that are also available with the WMF5 preview or, of course, final release. Right, because I don't have in, on this machine, the output path parameter. Well, I have the path, but I don't have that, because in, when I tested this on 
server 2012 R2 with V5, there was a output directory, as you see here, and that's not in this. It should be. <laughs> well, it's not in the help. I mean, I can try. I can try running the command here. So, start transcript will <clears throat> automatically create a file name that includes the timestamp and includes all the information you need. So you don't have to. You no longer have to try to randomize. Figure out okay, how am I going to keep track of what this transcript is? So you should be able to specify the path. Otherwise, it would go into your um, Windows PowerShell folder. I'm going to specify that I want a transcript to be created, and I don't care what it's going to be called, but I want it to be stored in this output directory. And what I don't know, and I'm going to save that to a variable $t, and I'll show you why in just a second. All right, well, I didn't get an error. Let's see if I got $t. Oh, I just ran the help? Oh, that would explain why. Don't get old because bifocals make it very hard to try to do demos and talk and say in the mic. All right, so I didn't get an error. Let's see what I get for dollar T. All right, so it did work. So even though the help file doesn't show you that transcript or doesn't show you that, that parameter, it's actually there in the command. So that's just a help. Am I doing something wrong? We might not have updated that help there. Okay. I usually use get command dash syntax as the source of truth. That will show all the parameters regardless of what we've got in the text version. All right, so there's, there's what dollar $t put up. So you can see the path and you can see the long name that includes the name of the computer. I'm assuming that's Lee M17. And then some randomization and then a timestamp. And within that object, we also get the path, which is kind of what I saw there. Right, so you can always check at any time, is drive a transcript running and look and see where that transcript is actually being recorded. So I'm going to create, actually, what's really nice is, no, I don't want sticky keys. I'm going to start another transcript that's basically going to be nested within a script here. So I'm going to have a script block here that's going to just do start transcript. It's going to put it in the my logs directory. In this case, I'm going to give it a specific name. I'm going to include another new parameter, this include invocation header. And we'll see what that gives us here. I'm going to run a couple commands and then stop the transcript. So let me just Define that script block and execute it. There we go. So that all ran. Let's add one other thing to my kind of like my outer transcript. Let's just do a quick get service. And then we'll stop the current transcript for the outer, the dollar T file, right? Is there a question? All right, so let's look at the nested transcript. So we get here, oh, let's do it this way. Easier to see. So we get some meta information at the beginning now that shows me who ran this, where they ran it. The verbose information came from my command. Now getting back to one of those earlier questions, do you see there the run as user? That's what happens when somebody's actually connected up with remoting and pretend that we've done a, a run as user switch in either GL or a constrained endpoint. What you'll see here is the username will be the person that actually connected the run as user will be the, the effective user. So this lets you take a look at a transcript that's been done on a PowerShell remoting session and go, okay, let me, let's say in a log directory that includes a lot of these things, 
which one of them were run when this evil Lee guy connected up, or this great Jeff guy connected up, and were any of them compromised? And then you can start to see, look over their shoulder of what they've done in those, in those sessions. The question was, this is a text file. Is there any way to get a more structured version of this? Yes, so that's actually, um, so this include invocation header thing that Jeff is talking about, that is kind of the way, the real fundamental thing about this is it's intended to be an over the shoulder view. So it's got whatever random prompt they had, whatever random commands they typed, whatever random output there was. So there is no structure except for the command response sort of view. And so that's what the invocation helper header really helps you with, is doing that split. So, and this is the outer, you know, the first transcript I did. So this also includes the command start time, in addition to the header information. Now, if you want a ton of structure, that's when we start talking about the script block logging in a, in a bit. Right, so there's, and all right, as you saw, I'm running in the IC, and that just worked. I guess I didn't even think about that. I'm kind of excited that transcripts now work in the IFC. So even if you're using transcripts just to help do your script development, that's kind of cool. Like you're doing that. See, question. It, it's not intended to be something you can rerun at a late, later point in time to see what actually happened. The question no, it's not, was: Is this meant to be a thing that you can rerun at a later time? Th this might be my way to document what what a server is set up like. Uh, yeah, no, it's not like a transaction log like you might have in a database, although it's just a text file and you could probably write a script to turn it into one. I've, I've written functions in the past to use this to generate scripts, same idea. But that's not the scenario. The scenario is uh, if you're going to do some big operation, you turn transcripting on so that when in the middle of that things have gone crazy, you can go back to the transcript to see did you actually do the right steps? You can take a look at an error message that you got and then say, oh, that's what that thing meant. Because at the time, you might not know. So anything, you, if you're going to do something in production that's more than a few steps, you definitely want to turn transcripting. The other thing to point out, too, is that. Could you repeat that verbatim just sort of appear? Or just summarize it? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> question mark, Conley, you raise his left eyebrow. And. <laughs> So the, the question was, hey, is there a way that you can uh, start to record these command lines? And Jeffrey's point was, you really want to make sure that you're using transcripting when you're doing complicated things in production that aren't already scripted. That way you can go back in history and say, I got a weird error message. Maybe realize that you made a mistake back there and it screwed something up. And so it's a really great way to make sure that you're doing things in a more structured way. One thing I'll also point out is that the transcript uses your actual prompt. So if you want to do some kind of complicated, interesting things, make your prompt, you know, some hash code or something, and then you can just rep through all of your, your, your log files for that thing and extract out the prompt, and then you can see where the commands were typed and then get a history of everything that you've done over all these servers that maybe not have been scripted. Question. <laughs> I'm good as XML so, so that it, it, it can be constructed as an object or it just flat text. So that's question number one. Question number two is um, uh, all right, I forgot question number two. <laughs> <laughs> the question number two was why is this microphone so close? So the object thing is I think is kind of coming back to the last question of um, Keeping the output of, for example, get process, all that is by XML, I think that's really not really the, the place where transcripting is meant to go. What you can do for that is kind of more complicated stuff in PowerShell. So for example, I have a I have a uh, overridden out default that captures everything that gets sent to it and stashes it off to a variable. So whenever I type command, I always have dollar underbar underbar representing the output of the last thing. So that's the thing I do in my profiles, and you could always have 
that same kind of thing in your profile that's logging objects everywhere. If you uh, think back to some of the early questions about why does transcripting concern you, it's just ridiculous amounts of data that you don't know how to deal with. And doing Chi XML for every object that goes to the pipeline is going to be adding to that as well. So we've kind of stayed away from that for now. Uh, just wanted to point out that Kirk Monroe has a module that he's published called History PX, which does that same kind of thing, except you can actually go back and get the output of any command in your history um, in that same way. So it's pretty handy for, for interactive use. Yeah, we <clears throat> want to log here. Uh, so, question. Uh, one more question. Uh, how can you include the script name which was executed by the user in that transcript? What the, uh, the, so the question, like, wow, I gotta unlearn habits all of a sudden. Do I still need to push the button with all these ma magic microphones? <laughs> so the question is, how do we record the script name? And truthfully, the, the transcript is meant to be an over their shoulder thing. So you can see which directory they're in. You might know that what the system path is. You can see what script name that they typed. Now the, the thing I'll point out in a second, and we're just about to get into it, is some of this like, really crazy detail stuff that you guys are looking for, is covered by the, the deep script block logging, and I'll show that right now. Yeah, see here, this is the outer transcript where I went ahead and defined a script block here. <clears throat> that could have easily just been me or the user executing a script, and you can see that it's all captured there. Is that what you're talking about? I'm, I didn't hear that. All right. So the, the main script that you are executing, right? And I want to see in the transcript that some user used this script to execute this series of commands. Since your transcript is showing all the commands by date and time, that's good. But down the road, when we're investigating an issue, what happened there? I want to know this user executed this script and this caused the output. And that's one of my question. Does it include the script name in there? Because in the minute that I was not there. Yeah, so it's a really great point. If you want to see exactly what people have run, that's a useful thing to add. And, and um, so transcripting shows you what you would see if you were looking over their shoulder. And so you wouldn't necessarily, if you were looking over somebody's shoulder, you wouldn't necessarily know exactly what script they're running. It could have been from their path. So there are other features that actually do nail that situation. And so I'll talk about them right now. Now one thing you might wonder about is, how do I set up this transcripting? Here's a uh, little module I'll, I'll share out, PS Security. So this is just a bunch of functions that enable and disable all this stuff. I don't think that sharing out this module is really the right way to do it, because you're not going to be doing this sort of management in bulk. It's great for demos, which is why it's not, for example, in the product itself, but it's not so great for mass configuration. So for mass configuration, I think you really want a DSC resource for these things, or you want to have a, and or a group policy. <coughs> and just to be clear, we've moved beyond transcripts and now into logging. Yeah. So make sure everyone follow the transition here. So here's, here's an example of, we are just storing all these things in registry keys. Here's an example of a thing that you could put in your profile or a system startup script or a D DSC resource for anybody coming on the machine to enable transcripting. Yes, exactly. You don't want to be not necessarily doing the local group policy. So here are a couple of the settings. We're not go, going to go into too much detail, but turn on PowerShell transcription is here. It's available. So you saw the output directory. So I just enable it. I can give it an output directory, include invocation headers. Now you put this out, and all machines are 
now being set to automatically log transcripts. So where I think a really useful way to think about this is, is not really always logging to the local machine because if that machine gets rolled, then you don't have necessarily any notice of what happened. So this output directory can absolutely have a You can absolutely send this to a, a machine that's got great back file store that's catching all the transcripts from all the machines in your domain. Now, if you're doing this, uh, one, of, one of the concerns is, hey, I've got all these machines, they're dumping transcripts to a remote machine. What happens if an attacker can start to read items from that file share? So this will be shared out, but this is an example of how to create a transcript share on a computer that will let any computer on your domain write to it, but what it will prevent are other people from reading files that they haven't written or even files that they don't know about. And that's one of the reasons why, if you notice, in that transcript file there was kind of a bit of a bunch of random junk. That junk is to prevent any sort of collisions when you've got a lot of these things doing it at scale you can still have a lot of people writing to this shared file share, and then you can use this later on for data collection or ingestion into another pipeline if you've got it. But we've had a lot of questions here about how do I get some really structured logging going on? In addition to this over-the-shoulder style of transcript logging, there's another one that we've supported. Now it's called script lock logging. Now, how many people have seen maybe in a antivirus or something where you see a blog post about a PowerShell virus and they always have this screenshot of PowerShell dash encoded command and you're like, what language is this? What Greek is this? No? I've seen it. Has anyone else seen it? Yes. So let's take a look at one of those, what they might look like. So here's an example of a PowerShell running an encoded command. It's in base64, it's in this like hacker format, and it's got, just to make things easier, we're gonna clear the event log just before this. Now what happens if an attacker runs this, and what, what does it actually show in your event log? So what we're gonna do here is, <clears throat> We're gonna enable the PowerShell script lock logging right now. And then we're gonna run this, and then we can start to analyze what actually happens when you run this crazy encoded command. And that is just a function that sets the registry keys that you would normally, you would also do through the policy. Exactly, yeah, that was just a function exported from the module. Question. Do those policy changes take effect immediately? The, the policy changes, take into effect the next time the shell starts up. We wanted to prov make sure that when the policy is, um, we don't want to be grinding against the registry for every command, every script block. So, you know, we just, we do it when the shell starts up. Gody PMP is going to talk in his group policy session. He's going to mention some of this stuff we're covering as well. So here's an example. What happens if this runs on your network and how do we figure out what actually happened afterwards? So let's run it. I don't actually know where the speaker is on this. There we go. All right, so your domain just got popped. Oh no, this thing. Just got worse. I think I'm fixing it. There we go. So what just happened there? Let's stop the transcripting.
Now, we weren't just blind here. That thing ran PowerShell with an encoded command, and then some stuff that we still don't know, but we just got rickrolled. How did that actually happen, right? So let's take a look. What's the ID 4104? It's my favorite ID. That's the ID for script block logging. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're going to pull out here. Here's an example of... Um, so here's just an example of one of the scripts that was loaded. This is just coming from the Windows event log. You see here that you've got a time created, provider name, and the actual message. And so let's take a look. We can actually take a look at this entire session of what happened here. So if you were clever enough now, you could go through the log and want to, like, to rebuild what happened and write the script to parse through the log and recreate the commands from the messages. Or if those of you looking for structured data, well, there it is. So what's happened here is you see that that, that script block logging, that's the actual PowerShell script block. So if you're doing, trying to do some data ingestion later, you can take this, parse it into an AST. You can use that AST, run script analyzer against it if you want. You can see if anyone's writing, running just crappy scripts on your domain. Or you can go off and write more complicated rules that are checking for commands that you're concerned about. And so let's take a look at what happened in this session. So you see here, there is PowerShell evaluating as prompt. Here, this is, you can see some, some aspects of PowerShell starting up. So this is interesting when you start to say, well, what if an attacker has actually compromised some of PowerShell's startup scripts or has compromised my profile? You can actually see every script block that PowerShell loaded during an invocation. Now, this encoded command, what PowerShell actually did, the encoded command parameter is used by PowerShell when you're piping PowerShell to itself. It's automatically encoding and decoding objects. And it uses encoded command to make sure that the command string isn't corrupted during the invocation. So PowerShell decompressed that into this command here. Again, one of the favorite te techniques of people running invoke expression on dynamic content that's been downloaded from the net. But this was logged in PowerShell still. So we got here, this is PowerShell loading a module based on needing to auto load the invoke expression commandlet. Now you start to see some script that's not from that. So you see here, this is a PowerShell HTML5 prototype. You can see some stuff. There's another ton of compressed stuff. Again, another attackers love to compress, encrypt, hide. So you might think that you're kind of SOL right here. You've got compressed stuff. But what you'll notice, if we come down past here, this is creating a memory stream in C Sharp and it's decompressing all that crazy gzipped data that I just downloaded from the internet back into raw PowerShell of some form that it's going to start to invoke. And so you see here that it's created these, does invoke expression on this structure. So you've got an attacker who's used encoded command, a dynamic invocation from a website that's used compressed data and now we're, we're, that's like four levels. And let's come down. We can start to see this invoke expression was then run. And this is the, the frames that was done in that invoke expression. It still looks kind of complicated.
But you can see here, this is a, a text encoding of the kind of the video frames that were displayed. So there's nothing that's secret anymore about what happens in PowerShell on your systems. You can set up script block logging and capture all these things. Question over here. So the uh, script block logging, what does that do with credentials that you so the question is, with script block logging, what does that do if I have encrypted credentials or use something with credentials? That's that's a that's a really big concern. Is when people are encrypting data and it might have credentials. So one of the most important points is really to try to avoid that. But that obviously can never be completely true. There's going to be things that happen on your system that you're very, very concerned about. You don't want, for example, an attacker who gets on to be able to see this stuff. So we'll be getting into that actually in a bit. Thanks for the question. So we're going to take, because we're up for our time here, so we're going to take a quick little break to rehydrate. We'll start up again at 11 and continue on with more of this. Hopefully you're finding this useful. Um, so we'll be back, we'll see you back here in about 10 minutes or so. Yep. Thanks. Thanks.